Look, I'm not going up against nobody who is in the Olympics getting gold medals for shooting things. I don't want to go to war with that person. But they turned into a battleship commander, Willis Ching Lee. Let's see what he's talking about, man. This man is the greatest gunslinger of all time, and you've probably never even heard of him. Today we're talking about Willis Augustus Lee, up. So William was good. Ching Lee. This man won five Olympic gold medals in a single Sheesh. year for shooting, then went on to become a battleship commander and used the same principles that he learned at long range precision shooting and applied them to the massive 16 inch guns on the USS Washington to become the most successful battleship commander ever. What? And he did all of it with myopia. Myopia? What's that? Sponsor this video oh. commander ever. We gotta see what myopia means. With myopia. Okay. Lack of imagination, foresight, or intelligent insight. Nearsightedness? And he was a... There's no way. There's no way. Yeah. But first, a word from our sponsors. This Man's video is brought to you by Delete Me. Oh, Nicholas. I thought you would never ask. Oh, 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 oh hey, hey, hey. Listen, I'm, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> we can't have no jokes like that on the YouTube. Whenever you click that little check, <laughs> they, they, they going 360 no scope this video out of here. Mark that says, I agree to these terms of service. Mm. Inside of those terms of service, w Panda, it usually man. says, w hey, Panda. our app or our service isn't actually free. Time to we make though. money as we use this to harvest all of your data. And then we turn around and sell that data on the internet. And that's how we make money. If so facto, our app or our service isn't free. We've just turned you into the product. And now we're going to sell you. I think we can all agree mm. that's not cool. But that's the unfortunate fact of life. Nothing is actually free. But Here's the good news. You sign up for Delete Me. You use the discount code electrician. It's going to save you 20%. You're going to end up paying like $6 a month to get all your information deleted off the internet and all that free shit that you've already enjoyed. While it might not actually be free, Delete Me can make sure it only costs you like $6 a month instead of having all your personal information. I need to do internet. that. So go check them out. I'll have that link and discount code down below. Let's get back to the video. On Six hours a month? I have to buy Delete Ching Me. Lee, born in a small town in Kentucky in 1888. His father was you a, do a collab with had Snipe? a lifetime passion for shooting. Shooting, collabs coming for man. shooting that he would pass on to his son lee jr by the time lee was 10 years old he was such a good shot that he could shoot a bird in flight with his 22 because of that he became his small local town's pest exterminator anytime anybody had any rodent or any type of pest that they wanted gotten rid of they would call the young ching lee he was and a he skeet shooter for them in addition to his passion for shooting he also thoroughly an enjoyed animal. blowing shit up for fun because well there's not a whole lot to do in kentucky in the early 1900s and america there is poop on everything! Unfortunately for Lee, this would bring about a lifetime full of problems because one day him and his brother decided to fill a coffee can full of black powder, have a line of black powder leading away from the can so that they could light it safely. They lit it, the fire went all the way down the line of black powder into the can, and mm -hmm. nothing happened. So they waited, and then nothing continued to happen. So finally, Willis Lee approached the can, looked at and it, it got up. close, opened it up, and then it blew up in his face, giving him severe burns all over his face and eyes. Due to the severity of the burns, oh. it was believed in the days immediately following the accident that Lee would be blind, blind for the rest of his life. Fortunately, he would regain a significant amount of his eyesight. However, his eyes were permanently damaged and he would have to wear thick glasses for the rest of his life. So obviously, That's not funny. Ching That's not Lee funny. was a pretty rambunctious I'm kid about, and that like, translated next to over into the classroom as well because he is the classic case of the kid that's so smart that school doesn't interest him or keep him stimulated. So he has a bad habit of giving off tasks and doing things he shouldn't be doing. Uh, mainly, he was a prankster and a humongous smartass. For example, mm. when he was 12 years old, he was already chewing tobacco and the teacher would always confiscate his pouch of tobacco walk it across the schoolhouse and throw it into the wood burning furnace in the corner finally lee got sick of the teacher burning up all his tobacco so he went home emptied tobacco out of the tobacco pouch filled it full of black powder and stuck that in his pocket and waited to go to school the next day sure enough teacher confiscates the pouch of black powder walks it over to the furnace throws it in and blows it blows up, up the entire wood furnace and then, in true smartass fashion, when Lee got in trouble for it, he said, Look, this isn't my fault. You took my shit, didn't ask me what it was, and then threw it into fire. That's 100% exactly. on you. On another occasion, the teacher had the audacity to send Lee home because his shoes weren't shined enough. So, he went home, shined his shoes, on stuck paper sacks over his shoes, and tied them up top with a rope. He then walked to school and refused to take the paper bags off because he didn't want his shoes to become unshined and not be within the school's Yo, he's one of them, the combination man. of all these things leave. he's like that what's that one video we watched of the fat electrician with a dude who built the car and they, they weren't allowed to have cars he's on levels with him bro they, they are elite 
Leave me alone. His father realizes that he needs to get his son into the military Tyler as soon was as good. possible. So he has some way to positively channel all of this energy. Otherwise, he's going to end up in jail or worse. So being that he was already a judge, he pulled some strings, gets his kid into Annapolis at the age of 16. Annapolis is where he would get his lifelong nickname of Ching. Originally, it was a different C word that's actually a racial slur. Apparently, oh, wow. it changed to Ching over time just because it was easier to say. Now, they didn't give him that name because he is Asian. He's a white dude from Kentucky. However, he does kind of look like he could be Asian. He wears round, thick glasses. His last name is Lee, and he is a huge Asian That's history That's crazy. Nerd. Sometimes even going as far as signing his signature in Chinese symbols. What I'm trying to tell you is if this were modern times, this dude would definitely Cancel. be watching anime. Kakarot, oh, yeah, sure. you've never kissed someone? Huh? No, of course not. Hey, R.I.P. Toriyama, man. Let me get it in the chat. Hey, you're married and have children. Yeah, duh, but what's oh, that to Oh, 666, six, that's what it was. You. Now, for his entire four years at Annapolis, he is thoroughly unamused with coursework. He pretty much speeds through it as fast as humanly possible so he can get back to studying things that he likes and going out and shooting guns. Now, because of this, he does join the Navy shooting team and his senior year, he gets an opportunity to go represent the Navy in a huge national competition put on by the National Rifle Association. At this competition, there is a rifle competition and a pistol competition. Lee has been selected to participate in the rifle competition. Now this rifle competition is a huge deal. There are 684 people there competing and they are all qualified to be there. Regardless, Ching Li ends up winning first place, earning the gold medal by getting a bullseye at a thousand yard target and he Dang. wins the entire thing before lunch. Not really having anything else to do for the rest of the day. He's like, fuck it. I guess I'll go do the pistol competition now too, just for funsies. Fast forward about 80% of the too. way through this pistol competition and Ching Li is winning and he wasn't even there to compete in the pistol competition. And as he's shooting different targets, his pistol blows up in his hand because one of the rounds that he had had too much black powder in it from the factory. It blew up his gun and messed up his hand. Not giving a shit, turns around to his buddies watching, somebody throw me a pistol. He grabs it, catches it with his left hand, finishes the round with, with one his hand? dominant hand, and goes on to win the pistol competition as well, earning two gold medals. Buddy is John Wick. He's John Wick. <laughs> being the only American to do it. So after that, he goes back to Annapolis. He's got both of his gold medals. This He's basically cooking. the Kevin Gates of gold medals. Oh, why are you, you following will, the OnlyFans girl on Instagram? Now, who, who I followed, I got OnlyFans on Instagram. Bad news, he has to take a physical first. And after going all the way through Annapolis schooling, finishing the program, and just winning two gold medals in a national shooting competition, they decide you're not qualified to actually join the Navy because, well, your vision's not good enough, despite Bro. the fact that you just yeah, scored a bullseye time. a thousand yards last week. So at this point, Ching Lee does exactly what every other badass with bad eyesight would do, and he cheats on that fucking eye exam and makes his way into the Navy. <laughs> Yes! Now, as an officer in training, he gets shuffled around to a bunch of different ships to get a bunch of different experiences, figure out what he likes doing, figure out what he's good at, get him exposed to everything. That's how this is supposed to go. During that time, he actually publishes his first ever article, and it's about the proper way of shooting a pistol. It gets published in the Naval Magazine, and he actually signs his signature at the bottom with a Chinese symbol again. Mm. Now, the reason I bring this up is because I like the quote that he actually put in this magazine, and that was, focus on acquiring accuracy before you try to acquire speed, which which is eerily similar fact. to the famous quote from also famous gunslinger Wyatt Earp, fast is fine, but accuracy is, is final. final. You gotta learn how to be slow in a hurry. My point being, game, recognize game. They're both onto something and you should probably write that shit down. Now, the young Lee finally makes his way onto the USS New Hampshire and that They're is cooking. when the They're occupation cooking. of Veracruz happens. All right, super brief, oversimplified version of what's happening right now. It is 1914 and Mexico is having a revolution and the new Mexican government is not a huge fan of the United States of America. Because of that, the Tempico affair ends up happening, which is the Mexican Tempico government basically affair. captures and detains a bunch of American sailors for a little while. It's a big diplomatic nightmare between Mexico and the United States. Because of that, the president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, decides that he's going to put an embargo on Mexico and he's not going to let any guns into the country because he's scared that they're going to use them against America. Mm. And in April of 1914, Mexico gets a huge shipment of firearms despite the embargo. If so facto, Woodrow Wilson sends in the Navy and the Marines to go get those weapons back. Now bear in mind, this is 1914. There's no Higgins boats. There's no amphibious landing vehicles. Nobody's doing D-Day type shit. So it's literally just a bunch of Navy and marine dudes getting driven ashore in whaling boats hopping out and going to find these guns <laughs> i guess because the president said so so since you know america's basically invading mexico some of the mexicans get pretty pissed off obviously so Hold they on, start you shooting this? at the americans which you know not super happy about it but I understand the sentiment. I would do the same thing if I were in their shoes. Now, True. unfortunately for them, the downside of shooting at people is they're probably going to shoot, shoot back, back, you know, assuming they have guns, which 
America always does. Now, somewhere along the line, Lee's entire unit gets pinned down by these enemy snipers that are up on top of roofs and inside of windows and high buildings, basically shooting at guys lower on the ground, and nobody's able to shoot these guys back, and everybody's just pinned down where they're at. Mm. So, Lee remembering like oh shit i'm the main character with bad eyesight i got this grabs his gun and just walks out in the middle of the street corner in broad fucking daylight with no cover whatsoever and he just sits there with his gun sure enough after a couple of seconds somebody finally shoots at him but they miss and now lee saw where they're at and lee he is cooking oh my god yo you know how much of a a freaking boss you gotta be to say all right look i'm gonna let you get the first move go ahead make your first move you better make the right one though we already know what's about to happen next lee shoots back and remember ching lee doesn't miss and then he continues to sit there and somebody shoots at him and they miss and lee shoots back and Lee don't miss. And this goes on for a while, pretty much until they quit shooting at Lee, presumably because there was none of them left. When asked about this later in life, the only thing Lee would say was, quote, yeah, I think I got a couple of them. Of all the men that were there That's and actually crazy. saw it, many of them had a much less modest version of this story to tell, with some of them claiming as many as 12 men were dispatched by Lee, all the while he was giving them the first chance to shoot at him. Then later during this Veracruz side quest, Lee is also credited again with saving a man's life by running through gunfire to get him and provide medical attention. The man is literally Their devil Eastwood, punish your dead shot. Exactly. and he's real. Oh, you're gonna look awfully silly with that knife sticking up your ass. You still here? Uh, no. Now, because of the bravery he displayed at Veracruz, he's put up for promotion by his leadership, mm. and he gets denied because his vision is too bad. Yo, and at this point, crazy. his entire chain of command is basically writing letters of recommendation, essentially yelling at the entire medical bureaucratic side of the navy that's denying him that they're insane because this guy's awesome seriously he gets like 20 letters of recommendation from high-ranking officers including the skipper of his current vessel the uss new hampshire and in that letter he says something along the lines of i saw lee crumple a man from 800 yards with iron sights at veracruz he can see just fine. So his promotion gets taken into consideration for an extended period <laughs> of time. Because of that, he gets taken off sea duty and <laughs> I'm gonna start using that. basically to the middle of the country. And he is working for the U.S. Navy, going to different factories and figuring out what these factories need to do to be able to better manufacture stuff for the U.S. Navy. During this time, he meets his wife in Oskaloosa, Iowa. Then America enters World War I and he gets sent over to Europe, although he does not get attached to a combat vessel, so he never actually sees combat. After mm. World War I, Lee would go on to compete in the 1920 Olympics, where he would actually win seven medals five gold one silver one bronze which would turn out to be the record for the most medals won by any one person at any one olympic games and that record would stand until 1980 Crazy. okay just so we're on the same page dude just won five gold olympic medals for sharpshooting and he's having trouble getting promoted because he has bad eyesight anyways for the rest of the 1920s lee spends pretty much the entire time working on different destroyers just working his way up the ranks becoming a bigger and better leader now about his style of leadership everybody absolutely absolutely loves this guy that works with him because he has this way where he just teaches people what they need to do and if they're not good at it he gets them good at it and then he just <laughs> lets them do their job he doesn't try to micromanage them he's not up everybody's ass he just wants to get people where they need to be that's really so the best types of leader right there so that they can do their job and then he goes and dicks off so he can go do target practice and build traps to kill rats because that was like his new hobby that was seriously what he was known for building elaborate mouse traps on destroyers he had ones that were like air guns rigged up to trip wires that would shoot rats which is the most American shit I've ever heard of in my entire life. There was another one that was really popular where he had a little miniature guillotine that he had electrically rigged up to a push button on his desk and all the boys would sit there and play a game when the rat would run across it they would try to hit the button just in time to cut the rat in half and then like whenever there was anything to shoot at from the ship he had his own private stash of guns in his quarters and he would run out and there'd be these like glass balls from abandoned fishing nets that would be floating in the ocean and he'd mm. run out and shoot at them from the deck and he'd invite them what do those balls do shoot with them over the pa system and he was actually out there teaching the marines how to become better shots everybody absolutely loved this guy so that goes on until about 1930 and then he finally makes his way back on 
onto battleships and heavy cruisers, at which point he gets absolutely obsessed with gunnery. He wants to shoot the big guns better than anybody ever has. Mm, he actually that's used all a writing like paper that later on got published talking about how battleships yeah, who got beef with the rats? consideration the curvature of the earth when they're gathering targeting data, and he develops the calculations for the battleships to do that. He's literally teaching people how to treat a battleship the way a sniper treats a gun. This man is insane, and he's doing all of this when gunpowder blew up in his eyes and they told him he was never going to see again. All right. This man's like, Hey, yo, you know what I be doing to hit people from seven miles away. He's turning it into wanted. Like I hit people from seven miles away with this calculation. If y'all use this calculation for the missiles that come out the boat, you're going to be cooking and it's highly effective. Because after publishing that paper, another battleship commander actually took that data and started implementing it, and his battleship won most accurate ship for the next three years in a row. Crazy. And he said it was all due to Lee's calculations. Dave, you're not catching on. Lee is actually treating his naval career the same way he treated his academic career. He's not interested in the normal coursework of like leading and micromanaging a bunch of sailors. He wants to get be everybody the best. where they need to be. He wants to get through his work as fast as he can so that he can go do stuff that interests him like pioneering new ways to be accurate with gunnery because of this he develops a reputation as a problem solver so late 1930s they send him over to washington dc a thousand and his yards are is get everybody True. ready for war because we know it's coming okay now this is probably the least coolest but most important part of the entire story this man essentially gets sent to washington dc to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against the united states navy's biggest nemesis the bureau of ordnance every yeah. time man every time Bitch, god you're very helpful, aren't you? You try to help to. everybody. Like, bro, I promise you, like, if if the United States got Superman, like, if Superman came to the United States, they would be like, yo, bro, you can't save people because you don't have a seatbelt, all right? You, you can't catch people and deliver them safely with a seatbelt on. Ah, we're going to have to leave it up to helicopters. Okay, helicopters got to go get them. You want to play another game? Okay, if you don't know, the Bureau of Ordnance is a bureaucratic nightmare that does nothing but slow down and halt any progress the U.S. Navy tries to make at literally anything ever. For example, if you remember like a month ago when I made the USS Parchy yep. video with loss and red ramage and he was shooting that torpedoes was at all these Japanese ships, but the torpedoes would hit and then not blow up because they were duds because it's a known fact that the Mark 14 torpedo fucking sucked and he complained to the chain of command and the chain of command told him, too bad, you just suck with torpedoes, the torpedoes are fine. That was the Bureau of ordinance. So basically, the chain of command has sent Lee to Washington, D.C. to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these guys because they know that Lee doesn't have the time or the temperament to put up with their bureaucratic bullshit, and they're absolutely correct because Willis Lee is about to turn into a wood chipper for red tape. So Lee shows mm. up, and he starts learning and finding out about all these fancy new toys the Navy has that are just being held up by bureaucratic nonsense. For example, I don't know, fucking radars. Lee, being the forward thinker that he is, he's like, you can put a screen in my office that tells me where the enemy is so that I can shoot them with my big ass guns without, without even having them, to see yeah. them yeah put that on every fucking ship in the navy what's wrong with you but don't worry because the bureau of ordnance and their infinite fucking wisdom doesn't seem to agree with lee and they don't think they're going to be that big of a deal and they just want to put them on some ships and they don't want to waste all their money on radars because uh, i mean it do like okay the one thing the u.s government gonna do they gonna make sure we don't let nothing through and if anything does get through all right nine times out of ten is gonna work okay they, they shooting like the feds. The feds don't show up to your door unless they know they got a case. P. Diddy, you're done, all right? But that's neither here nor there. But, um, yeah, they like, look, we don't know about them, them radars until they get so good that it's like, all right, let them through. So it looked like they green light. They, they green light success rate is really high or dumb apparently but they know lee's not going to take no for an answer so they tell lee that they can't get any more radars I'll due to manufacturing shortages to which lee you seen the back fine then i'll buy them from britain magically the Bureau of Ordnance found all the radars he could possibly Crazy. need. Imagine that. Okay, next order of business, American submarines. Their biggest weakness is having purified water because they can't purify water fast enough for how quickly they consume it because the mm. crew needs water and the batteries in the submarines at this point in time also eat a ton of water. Luckily, oh, wow. there's a new EVAP that. system that's going to allow them to have way more purified water and it's going to be great. Unfortunately, it's held up in bureaucratic red tape. Okay, like they're there. They're done. They've been manufactured. They're ready. 
but the government wants to run more tests on him, even though everybody in the Navy is like, no, they fucking work. We just, they're just not letting us use them. So mm. Lee just walks in, issues the order to install them, and if anybody has a problem, they can blame him. So Lee's just getting shit done. He's checking things off. Now, at this point in time, whenever you're doing a bunch of paperwork for the Navy, there's like a status box where you hit it with a rubber stamp to tell everybody how important this paper needs to get mm. through the bureaucratic process. Now, there's three statuses. Well, there's routine, priority, <laughs> and urgent. Obviously, in that order, urgent is like, we need to get this done as quickly as possible. Now, everything Lee marked was urgent. He didn't give a shit. He needed his shit done right now because that's just the type of guy he is. But unfortunately, they were still just not getting it done fast enough to his liking. So he's like, fuck it. I'm going to get my own rubber stamp made that said frantic. So then whenever anybody got Lee's documentation for the first time in their entire naval what? career, there's they a new the word, word stamped there in red ink that sounds more important than urgent. So everybody's just like, oh shit, we're doing this first. And then Lee just uses this to keep on powering through to get more and more shit done. Next thing is to get a school I could have went terribly the wrong, Navy though. that teaches sailors how to read aerial reconnaissance pictures because that's going to be huge in an upcoming war because they're going to need pictures to show where all the reefs and all the atolls are and they're going to have to be able to read those pictures accurately to get proper intel. So at first the chain of command is like, okay, well, we'll get Hollywood involved. They know things about like cameras and shit. That's the right answer, right? Yep. And Lee and a couple of other officers that actually have good ideas are like, uh, no, why don't we just go over to Britain and ask them to help us? We'll send a couple of guys over, get them trained by them because they already do this really well and we're on the same mm. team. It would be great. Why wouldn't you do that? We can share information with them and vice That's versa fact, and we all get better together. Hooray. At which point the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory is like, no, absolutely not because the United States Navy is way better than the British Navy and we know that because we conducted a study that we verified ourselves. Yeah. Okay, now in hindsight, I think we can all agree that's dumb. And Lee that's gambling why life ended away. Up sending a guy over yeah, there anyways so for any bullshit ass <laughs> excuse that he could find. And then ended up extending his orders every time they ran short. So he was just over there soaking up as much information and training as humanly possible. And that guy would actually come back and found the Naval School for being able to read aerial photography. Okay, so mm. that's going on. Lee just keeps charging, tackling more issues. Next thing on the docket, the Mark 53, aka the proximity fuse. Okay, I cannot stress to you how important fuse. this one actually is. This is one of the most important developments in World War II is the proximity fuse. Okay, it is basically the new type of anti-aircraft ammunition. Your only options prior to this were like shooting basically birdshot up at planes and hoping you fucking hit them, shooting 50 cals up at planes hoping you hit them, literally trying to hit a plane with a bullet, or you had mechanically timed ammunition where you were shooting it and it had a timer and then it would blow up in midair and you're just hoping that a plane happens right to cross at happens. that exact yeah. moment and everything works out. You're basically playing the lottery with all of those until the Mark 53 proximity fuse came out. Okay, it's a little more complicated than this, but it basically has its own tiny little miniature Doppler radar inside of it. And when mm. it's flying through the air, that Doppler radar is emitting signals and it's reading anything bouncing back at it. And once something gets close to this ammunition, it starts sending the signals back. And when it gets close enough and those signals come back frequently enough, it knows that it's near a plane in midair and, and blows it just up. blows up on its own when it gets near enough to the plane. Okay, it's the first type of ammunition that actually knows where the plane is and blows up at the right fucking time. That's it's crazy. It's a big deal. So naturally, the Bureau of Ordnance is like, wow, this thing's incredible. This is a total game changer. We're gonna go ahead and get in the way for no fucking reason. You wanna know what they say? I'm gonna tell you. They say that you're not gonna be allowed to use that new ammunition until it has a 100% reliability rate. Like, nothing in this world has 100% reliability rate. Except for me saying I'm gonna stream all the time and missing a day. Now that's 100%, okay? But everything else. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and say that again, but slower. The Bureau of Ordnance said that you're not allowed to use this new ammunition until it is a hundred percent reliable. Okay, do you understand how fucking stupid that is? You know what's a hundred percent reliable? Nothing. Nothing is a hundred percent reliable. Fucking condoms don't even have a hundred percent reliability, right? You want to get technical? Fucking abstinence isn't even a hundred percent reliable because Jesus was a thing, okay? I'm true! <laughs> hey! Hey, listen, listen, that, that, that... 0. 0.00001%. Hey, look, Joseph, you're going to have to believe it, big dog. Mar Mary was out here, you know, and you know. 
I'm pregnant. From my finger? No, you don't understand. God has blessed me with his child. You banged Kevin God from South Nazareth? You wanna know how smart and forward-thinking Ching Lee is? It's like 1939, and he already knew that the future of naval warfare was gonna be all about the carriers, and he's 100% right, but he knew at this point in time, okay? Because they came and they wanted to build this class of American heavy cruisers. It was gonna be the Alaska class. They made two of them, but they wanted to different? make like fucking 10 of them. And Lee came in and was like, no, those are dumb. You shouldn't have made the first two. Take all those resources, all that money, all that everything. Hey, build more to myself, fucking aircraft man. carriers. He was very adamant about it from the very Appreciate start. You, and he ended up being right. And that's exactly what the Navy did. And it had a humongous impact on World War II. Okay, so bearing in mind that he knows that the future of naval power is gonna be all based off of carriers and planes, he goes and adopts a strategy that every American ship, it, we're, we're done. We're done with these like pretty observation decks and shit. If there's room on the deck, we're putting anti-aircraft guns. Every American ship is gonna look like a fucking porcupine covered with 40 millimeter bofers and 20 millimeter orlicons. Okay, the only problem, he needs all of the guns. This dude sits down and does the math and figures out how many 20 millimeter orlicon, how many 40 millimeter bofers he needs to put on the decks of every ship in the U.S. Navy and puts in a purchase order for it and it gets kicked back because they're like, well, we're not going to put all these on the decks of the ships because, you know, we just don't think that we need that much. And Lee is like, cool, didn't ask for permission to put them on the decks. I just asked to order the guns. Exactly. To which they're like, shit, he has the authority to do that. And they stamped his thing approved and send it back to him and he gets to order the guns. Then he whips out the old eraser because he filled out the last half of the work order in pen and after it says order guns full stop stop he erases the full stop and then writes down and install them on every ship in the navy full stop and then that's what he does and then every time a ship comes back into port it's just like an army of naval dudes come on and just put anti-aircraft guns on everything everywhere this then december is... 7th 1941 the attack on pearl harbor happens at this point everything changes admiral ernest king like top dog at the navy at this point Bruh, so watch you have to watch turning point on netflix dude dude over to Lee, he's like, this guy gets shit done. I need somebody to make sure that the rest of the Navy is taking this seriously. So he promotes Lee to the Admiral of Fleet Readiness. And it is now Lee's job to make sure that the entire US Navy is like ready for war and treating this how they need to be treating this. And Ching Lee's immediate concern is security because they're, they're way too lax, okay? They're not even checking IDs. They're just letting people through, whatever. I mean, the orders have changed. Like they've been told, hey, button this shit up. There's gonna be spies coming, like whatever, but doesn't mean they're actually gonna do it so lee's gonna get to the bottom of that first things first remember prankster at heart he goes gets a new military id made except mm. this one has a picture of hitler on it he then proceeds to go and see how many maximum security naval institutions that he can get into with a u.s navy id with a picture of fucking hitler on it in world war ii and guess how many he gets into? all of them all of them nobody stops him like it's so ridiculous he's like i don't i don't think i look like hitler do i i mean i guess we're both dudes uh, fuck it we're just gonna have to get more ridiculous so he gets another id made with What's the famous female actress may west on it and he's like well i definitely don't look like her let's see how much shit i can get into now and then he still gets into a bunch of places that's that he's crazy. Not supposed to with this may west id so basically he's chewing ass and getting everybody ready for the security level required for world war ii with exactly. espionage and spies and all kinds of shit like he's doing full-on oceans 11 type shit he's got subordinates dressing up as butlers going into fancy hotels stealing top secret secret documents from top government officials holding them until they get reported as stolen just to see how long it takes all kinds of crazy this shit. is so this insane great. and as a reward admiral king makes lee the new commander of all of america's fast battleships so now lee's back in the game he goes and immediately starts training the entire crew of the uss washington in gunnery and night combat because he knows that the japanese navy has a big edge at night combat or at least they did before radar he goes mm. and then masters the radar to the degree that he's probably the most knowledgeable person on these radars in the u.s navy except for the people that literally built made them, them yeah Sorry, I ran out of time and I had to catch a flight, so we're finishing this video from Texas in my friend Eli's studio. Anyways, back to the story. Not only is he training all of his guys in nighttime combat, he also has to basically go back through and retrain his entire gunnery department because he's not- Hold up, Eli got a channel? What's Eli channel, man? We need to know so we can go see what Eli be talking about over there. Treating the USS Washington the same way every other battleship treats its guns. He's going through and treating each of the nine guns on the USS Washington like it's its own individual sniper rifle. And while he's doing that, getting the guns more and more accurate, he comes to the realization that all the targeting data and the charts that came with the USS Washington from the manufacturer were wrong. They were off. They weren't accurate enough. So he goes to the Bureau of Ordnance again and is like, hey, your charts are wrong. To which the Bureau of Ordnance is like,
No, they're not. You're wrong. Except mm. for the fact, obviously, Ching Lee doesn't miss. So he says, fuck it. And he redoes all of the charts and all of the targeting data himself. Over the course of the next couple months, he gets his crew and the guns on the USS Washington so accurate that he ends up having a light cruiser from his task force go 10 miles Bro, away. And facts. then he fires the guns towards that ship and has the ship That's call crazy. in and say how close it was to the actual target. And he can walk these shells right up to the wake of this light cruiser without actually touching it. Literally like putting an apple on top of your head and letting your buddy shoot at it with a bow and arrow, except he's doing it with battleships. So fast forward November, 1942, the battle for Guadalcanal is going on and the Japanese That's Navy crazy. is being sent to go bombard Henderson Field, which is an American airstrip that is instrumental to the war effort and they can't let it get destroyed. So Lee and his task force get sent in to go defend it. And right out of the gate, this entire thing is a shit show. They're sending in Lee in the USS Washington and the USS South Dakota, the USS Washington sister ship. Now, the real problem, they're sending in tonight. four destroyers with Simo, them, these destroyers were picked for the sole purpose of they were there and they were the ones with the most fuel. They had never worked with Lee. They didn't know how he operated. They did not really know what was going on, but it just kind of happened. They all got lumped together and got sent out to go defend Henderson Field. So they're out there on patrol. They end up getting basically ambushed by a Japanese task force that opens fire on the destroyers this task force has managed to hug one of these smaller islands to avoid being detected by radar open fire on the four destroyers ended up sinking three of them and critically damaging the third at which point they start opening fire on the uss south dakota at which point ching li sends a famous radio transmission stand aside i'm coming through this is Ching Li. Now this Japanese task force has a couple of destroyers. It also has the IJN Otago and the Takao, both of which are heavy cruisers. And they have their and flagship, the IJN Kirishima, which was originally a battle cruiser. But in the 1930s, it got a bunch of upgrades in armor and firepower, having it reclassed as a battleship. This is now a battleship versus battleship Fight. The Japanese task force is continuing to target the South Dakota. Lee sneaks around the backside, clears the South Dakota, turns all nine of his guns and opens fire directly at their flagship, the Kirishima. It. And with the first salvo, he hits and then he keeps hitting and he hits more and he's hitting the enemy so hard so fast so accurately they don't even start returning fire and within the span of five minutes he manages to hit the kirishima with 20 main battery hits Jesus. and 24 hits from his secondary five inch guns okay each one of those shells is 16 inches in diameter and weighs 1700 pounds willis ching lee just bitch slapped the kirishima <laughs> with a goddamn car dealership in five minutes okay just so we're on the same page the kirishima is now been reclassified twice oh, no, i'll scratch my leg chill out relax relax all right relax japanese upgraded it and reclassified it from a battle cruiser to a battleship and ching lee has now just downgraded it from a battleship to a fucking coral reef and he did it in <laughs> five minutes this is the last time in world history that a battleship sank another battleship in combat now, oh, wow at this point, the uss south dakota's had so many electrical problems that the guns are down and the radio's down lee has no way to communicate with the south dakota but he can tell that it's trying to pull away from the fight and it's still getting attacked by the two Japanese heavy cruisers and the destroyers. So Lee, not knowing the status of the USS South Dakota, decides that he is the most able man in this fight and he needs to get all of their attention so that they can come fight him instead. So he opens fire on the heavy boss, cruisers, man. trying to get their attention, which he gets. He then proceeds to go the opposite direction as the USS South Dakota so that they quit chasing it down and they chase him instead. So they're chasing him down, but here's the problem. They're chasing him. They're behind him. He can't turn the ship around to shoot at him with the big guns without getting shot in return. And he doesn't want to get his boat shot shot up because this isn't a boat it's a goddamn precision instrument okay this is a giant fucking sniper rifle i don't want to be taking shots so he comes up with a better plan you see he hasn't just been working on the gunnery skills of the nine 16 inch guns on the uss washington he's also been doing it on all of the five inch guns as well and those turrets can still turn around and hit the enemy and they are so accurate with their fire that lee orders them to start targeting the searchlights on the other ships and they start they're blowing hitting all them? the lights out so they're not going to be able to see the uss washington at night and then they start firing star clusters which is just white phosphorus the reason they do that is because remember the japanese don't have radar that's not how they're targeting the washington all they're targeting has to be done optically so now the japanese guys are blinded looking at night and there's white phosphorus burning as it's floating through the sky and it's going to fuck up all of their optics and they're not going to be able to hit the uss washington this is insane. so ching lee and the uss washington do this and just lead the japanese further and further away from the uss south dakota until he's confident that they're going to get away too and then he just slips away into the night virtually unscathed he got hit a single time 
by a five inch gun, mm. which is the equivalent to a grown ass man getting hit with an airsoft gun. It's nothing. This For this, Admiral <laughs> Lee would be awarded the Distinguished Service Cross by Admiral Halsey. And when he received it, his crew demanded a speech. He turned around and simply said, and I quote, you want it, I'll, I'll wear, wear it. it, which is one of the coolest things That's I've fire. ever heard a military leader say ever for the rest of world war ii it was honestly pretty quiet for the uss washington they were involved in some shore bombardments and they mostly just ran anti-aircraft operations for the aircraft carriers because he lived happily ever after war then by 1945 all of the japanese battleships had been recommissioned into coral reefs and there just wasn't any reason to have all the fast battleships around anymore so they took lee from the battleship and they wanted to use his talents elsewhere because now the biggest threat to the u.s navy was kamikazes and they wanted mm. ching lee to be working on the anti-aircraft measures to help prevent this unfortunately this story does not have a happy ending because as he made his way back to america to begin working on those anti-aircraft measures on august 25th 1945 he would suffer a massive heart attack that would kill him in a matter of minutes. i mean nobody so in conclusion, yeah, yeah, that yeah, is a story yeah, of yeah, willis yeah. ching no, nobody took him out though okay he went out the game because of his own conditions all right him Lee. He is one of the most He's important him. people in naval warfare history, and he gets nowhere near the credit that he deserves. And I would argue that he is absolutely the greatest gunslinger of all time. The definition of a gunslinger is somebody that carries a gun and knows how to use it. And I don't think there's ever been anybody on the planet better at that than Willis Ching Lee. Not That's only crazy. does this man carry a gun and know how to use it, he has a gun that carries him, and he knows how to use that one too. Capable of hitting a bullseye with any caliber of gun, from a pistol to the 16 inch guns on a battleship. <laughs> this man could do it. So thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. <laughs> Whack bang out. Hey man, that boy Willis Lee is cooking. Okay, he's cooking. You see him out and open, you turn around and run home. All right, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing for you. Okay, but uh, listen. They, I don't know what it is with the U.S. military telling people, ah, your eyesight is a little trash, all right? I feel like just like all sporting in high school, you know, Little League or Pop Warner, what they call it, you should get tryouts, okay? If you fail, you should, if, if your eye exam fails, you should get a tryout, an extensive tryout, not like, oh, you hit a bullseye once, you're in, like, you got to prove it over and over and then we'll let you in. And there's no way my man was not getting inside the military, bro. And when he did, he cooked. All right, he cooked.